good afternoon. Uh, another day at, uh, at Davos winding down a little bit. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a, um, an issue briefing on a very new uh, area of work at the World Economic Forum. So I thought I'll share with you a little bit what we're doing here. Um, uh, I'm joined on this panel by two individuals who will shed some light on these important issues. I'll start uh, with the end there with Mr. Philip Metzger, who is the Director General of the Office of Federal Communications in Switzerland. This is the office that, uh, to a larger degree, sets the digital policies and the telecommunications policies for uh, the country of Switzerland. Thank you, Philip, for joining us today. And then immediately to my left is Amitabh Kant, who is the head of NITI, NITI, which is the organization set uh, by His Excellency Prime Minister Modi in India to drive some of the biggest initiatives to digitize India uh, across uh, the vast uh, country and the states so that there is uh, execution and uh, the vision turns into reality. Thank you very much, Mr. Kant, for joining Thank us you. as well. So I will start by giving you a little bit of background on this particular project and what we're doing in it, and then I'll invite my colleagues to comment on that and then if any, leave some time a little bit for some questions by the press. Um, let me start by saying that trust in the digital space is going down, especially in the developed world. People are starting to feel that the digital realities uh, are not necessarily aligned with their uh, good uh, good. And uh, this is not uh, really boding well, because if people start looking at innovation as a negative thing, uh, that, I think, will hurt us in the long term. Uh, this uh, morning, Mr. Richard Edelman, who is the head of Edelman Communications, released the yearly report called the Trust Barometer. And uh, it was stunning to hear that only 15 percent, one five, uh, of the world population, according to this massive survey, now trust the system of governance of our planet. Uh, that's a remarkable low number, <laughs> and it uh, does not bode well. Uh, as usual, uh, governments and media ranked last, uh, and uh, business and NGOs ranked at the top. But frankly, when you look at the numbers, the trust in all of them has gone down significantly. And in fact, the study showed that the least trusted individuals who are leaders or in positions of power today are actually corporate CEOs. That is a change from where we were even a year ago. Uh, what is driving that is in large part uh, the advent of technology that is changing our lives, changing work, changing the power structure of the world, right? This is what's happening today. So the World Economic Forum had the vision a year ago to start addressing this issue in a very practical way. What we are missing are actual norms or rules, I prefer to call them protocols, that enable business, government, users, technologists, academics if necessary, to work together to design frameworks that address the core issues we are facing in both the digital economy and the digital society. There are many issues. We outlined close to 50 very urgent issues, ranging from how should corporations engage in active defense, all the way to how do we give uh, women rights in the digital space and protect that. So the, the, the range of issues is vast. However, the mechanism to solve these issues is still unclear. If you say, let's go to intergovernmental institutions, then many people say, that's not representative of all the stakeholders. You need business, you need technologists, you need civil society, you need others. If you go to governments alone, trying to set national digital policies, that are incongruent with the transnational nature of the internet, you will fragment the internet. You will fragment the policy space. So we do have 
real concerns, and the forum then created a platform to bring us together to start addressing those issues. These are called the transnational networks, and you have a, a little page that describes them. This is a brand new experiment in governance, and how do we do it together? Uh, we call it, in the political science world, a horizontal experiment of governance, as opposed to a vertical or top-down governance model. And that, by the way, is very aligned with what Mr. Edelman said today about trust, that the trust pyramid has been flipped. We used to think that our leaders are to be trusted, and they passed the trust down to the system. Today, trust is very horizontal. Most people trust their peers. They don't trust authorities. But if you bring peers to work together to solve problems, they can solve them more easily and influence each other to implement them more easily. That's called horizontal governance. So these are horizontal networks of governance. We have launched three of them at the forum to test that model. And I'm happy to share with you today that the three networks are all up and running. Tens of experts, horizontal experts, came together from government, business, academia, technical environments, and they're addressing these three issues. I'll touch on them quickly. The first, how do you build safety into the IoT framework? Today we have 14 and a half billion things that talk to the internet. By 2030 we will have 100 trillion things that talk to the internet. Are these things being built with minimum safety requirements so, the, so they don't become weaponized? A month ago, when the internet was shut in the Western United States, it turned out people used baby monitors and hacked them to close the entire internet in the Western United States. And that's just the beginning. When we have trillions of these things built without minimum safety requirements, then we risk the entire infrastructure of our or our world. So the first network is building minimum safety requirements that every IoT builder, whether it's a toothbrush that talks to the internet, a heart monitor that talks to the internet, or even a piece of software embedded in something that talks to the internet, has minimum safety requirements. That's the first network. The second network is addressing the issue of ethics in big data and artificial intelligence. So I'll give you one case, and then you'll understand what we're trying to address. If some cloud platform knows the data from my watch about my walking, and the data from my heart monitor about my heart, and the data from my doctor about my latest blood test, if they take all that data and they put it through an algorithm that decides that I'm going to die within a year, who owns that information? Who could they share it with? My wife, my insurer, my employer. What are the rules about that? The ethics of big data and AI, which compounds data, are still the Wild West. There are no frameworks to decide how we're going to do this. So the second network is addressing that. And if you see who's involved in it, it's almost the who's who in both the public, private, and civic space to start framing these ethical frameworks. Now this brings me to the third and last pilot network we launched this year, because that's the one uh, Mr. Metzger and uh, the President of Switzerland, President Luthard, have been quite engaged in, and I'll let him speak to it. But that's a network that is addressing the issue of national digital policy in an environment where the internet is really not national. The internet is truly transnational. It's not even international. It's a transnational network. So how do you build national digital policies that don't break your country's relationship with the transnational internet? We formed that network, and for each network we have what is called a steward or two stewards in some cases. The steward is a high figure of public or private background that is stewarding the work of the network and making sure the world understands the value of that work. This particular third network is stewarded by Her Excellency President Doris Luthard of Switzerland, who's represented here by her Director General. And I give you the word, Philip, so you can share with people why Switzerland involved in this network and what do you think will come out of the work 
that the form is enabling there. Thank you very much, uh, Fadi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I think it's uh, very timely that we can talk about uh, this network and also our involvement. Because um, maybe I'll, I'll take a few steps back uh, initially, back a few years. Um, Fadi and I, we have a, a long history of being involved in, in internet governance questions, dealing with that. Um, we have been advocates, uh, Switzerland has been a strong advocate of multi-stakeholder approaches and processes all along, specifically uh, in the internet governance discussions. Of course, this is something which is close to our heart as a country. Uh, we have a, a very, as you know, intricate system of federal structure with sub-federal levels. We have a direct democracy, and so for us, multi-stakeholderism in the ways we know, uh, in the way it's set out in the Constitution, is something that we're breathing every day. But when it comes to digitization, when it comes to the internet, and when it comes to the challenges of the information society, um, we're maybe not so far advanced. We had a strategy in Switzerland on the information society ever since the World Summit took place um, in, in Geneva. And we have been um, using that strategy to, uh, I think, a good purpose. But we also felt in the past few years that there was um, a lack of traction going forward. And what we realized is we had this nice initiative but we really didn't engage with the stakeholders in the way that we ourselves ideally think uh, everybody should do. And so we uh, went back to the drawing board in a sense. Uh, we did an assessment of where we stood and where we stood with regard to the future. And there, of course, digitization came in. And I think what uh, the WEF contributed to this debate last year was absolutely outstanding. It was absolutely crucial uh, annual form as well, as well as this one, of course. Um, and we did an assessment not in a way where uh, we, in, a, in an administration, uh, you know, go back to our offices, we are ordering some studies from the outside, but we engage with stakeholders. On a small scale, of course, because um, you can't do this uh, right away on, on a very large scale, but we made sure we had representativity in that assessment, so we had stakeholders from civil society, from the research community, uh, from economy, of course, and political stakeholders. Um, and so we really tried to build uh, in a small core discussion, in a sense, on that. And what came out of that is a strategy that the Federal Council, the Swiss government, adopted last year, um, which is called Strategy uh, uh, for the Digital Switzerland, um, which is a strategy which should be not a paper in the first place, it should be a process. So of course we will have to choose um, the most relevant parts at the moment that we think need to be pursued. I think Fadi made the very salient point about trust. I think it's a key aspect in all this. But of course opportunities is a key aspect as well. And I, I think uh, there are different cultures across the globe. Not everybody has the same new frontier attitude and Switzerland is very good in um, in, in, you know, in perfect execution, but I think we also needed, in a, in a sense, a kick to be more open and to be more um, forward-looking as to how digitization can be used. What is very important in this, and I think this is in line with what we heard at the opening speech this morning um, uh, at the World Economic Forum, is that we need to be inclusive. We can't leave parts of the society behind. This can't be something that only benefits the economy, for instance, so it has to be truly uh, a common uh, venture, and I think what we have seen since last uh, April when this strategy was adopted in Switzerland was very heartening to us because we see a flurry of activities and of stakeholders engaging, thinking um, what they should uh, put forward as claims as also as ideas. Um, we have extremely good um, discussions with the, the economy that has organized itself in a remarkably short time in an engaging way that doesn't want to be an economy only an exclusive approach but one that engages with the civil society and so that is course is of course for us it's a new venture we don't know how this will pan out it's important that we don't try to do the perfect shot at once we can't it's too complex uh, this will be an ongoing process forever in a sense and we wanted to do it in a rolling way and so we have a dialogue we have established a national dialogue which then should culminate regularly in kind of national conferences uh, where we take stock and where we are challenged as well as government as to how the strategy should be shaped going forward. And when the initiative from the WEF came for a network for national digital policies, um, bearing in mind what I just said, this was obviously right down our alley. And we were enthusiastically jumping on this um, and also participating from, from day one because we think we, have, we can gain a lot from the wisdom all around the globe. Uh, we're all in the same apprenticeship, in a sense. 
Um, and of course, we have many items, and that has also been identified in our own national strategy that can only be solved transnationally. Uh, and so that is really uh, why we are enthusiastically uh, engaging and why the president of the Swiss Confederation is also assuming a stewardship role together with the president of the Inter-American Development Bank in this. And I think that is uh, for us um, a great opportunity. Thank you, Philip. I want to emphasize before I ask a couple of questions of our colleague, uh, Mr. Kant, what you just said about uh, Switzerland's incredible experiment to engage all stakeholders to come up with digital policy is a great model for the rest of the world. However, that model may or may not be the right one for every country. Hence the importance of this network that the forum did, because one of the first things it will do is it will catalog the different approaches. How is Switzerland doing that? How is Indonesia doing that? How is Brazil doing that? And then, so we're cataloging these in the network. So when a country is thinking, how do I set this up for my, for my own population, they will have an understanding of that. The second outcome this network will produce is an actual decision algorithm that helps a country sort through how to build digital policy, what would be the right approach, what are the right things to do or not to do, based on their own experience. So they're developing that science as well. So that's a, a very, very important pieces that will be available uh, to assist countries in actually building their national digital policy. I travel around the world to meet with business and global uh, public leaders who are focused on the digital economy and society. And I must say, when I get to India, and I just came back from Delhi, it is frankly hair-raising what this prime minister has unleashed on the country. It is quite remarkable. And it is not, frankly, to be quite direct, it is not talk, hence the role very much of Mr. Kant, which is execution, change, the fundamentals of how the economy and the society work for the benefit of this great country. Uh, incredible work is going on in India right now. Every time I go, I come back highly energized by the great work there. I want to ask you, Mr. Khan, to walk us through two things. One is uh, the commitment of your government, which, to be quite direct, is a government that for many years before His Excellency Prime Minister Modi came to power, has been a government that put all of its uh, focus on empowering international <laughs> intergovernmental institutions to lead uh, in various spaces of governance. But now, under Prime Minister Modi, India has become the number one proponent of what Mr. Metzger shared, which is a policy of multi-stakeholder solving of issues. I mean, the speeches that we heard from your minister, from your Office of National Security, are quite remarkable. And India is leading the way now amongst developing nations in explaining the value. Please tell us, in your view, why this is so important for your country and why the focus on it. And secondly, you've been directly involved in, in my opinion, one of the most amazing digitization initiatives on the planet, which is the demonetization effort that happened in India. All of us have read about this extensively. And you've been directly involved in that. Please share with us your view as to what will be, not the short term, of course there will be short term implementation issues, that happens with anything, but what will be the medium to long term impact of this on your country and the billions of people who trusted the Modi government to deploy this policy? Yeah. Uh, so Fadi, let me first uh, thank you for this very fascinating discussion. So you know, India is an oasis of growth in the midst of a very barren economic landscape across the world. We are growing at about 7.6% per annum. But the challenge for India is really to grow at even higher rates at about 9 to 10% over the next three decade period to be able to lift a very young population above the poverty line. We are passing through a window of demographic transition, which rarely happens in history. 72% of our population is below the age of 32. So it's a very young, population and uh, uh, Mr. Modi's belief is that uh, India must embrace digital te technology 
and use digital technology to leapfrog several generations. And therefore, he's himself a very passionate driver of digital technology. He's unleashed several new programs. Uh, he's unleashed Make in India. And he's unleashed Digital India. He's unleashed Startup India. And all these programs of his are aimed at young generation leapfrogging in many ways to catch up. And therefore, uh, his belief is that India must embrace technology and India must make it inclusive. It's important because uh, as soon as he came into power, one of the key programs that he launched was that he opened up bank accounts of a vast segment of our population, which was below the poverty line, which did not have bank accounts. <coughs> but he did something which is known as the Jam Trinity, the Jandhan Aadhaar movement, and that is that you, India is the only country with a billion biometrics. It's the only country with a billion biometrics in the world. India is the only country with a billion mobile in the world. No other country has a billion mobile. And by 2022, India will be the only country in the world with a billion smartphones. So everybody is switching from GSM to a smartphone. Now, his view is that the physical world is dead. The physical banks, if you were to go around creating physical banks everywhere, it'll be a very long, expensive process. And therefore, you have to convert the mobile into your bank. You have to convert the mobile using digital technology into your wallet. And you have to leapfrog. And this was necessary because India is a $2 trillion economy, but it also has a $1 trillion black economy. <coughs> so it has a huge percent black economy. So it has a huge informal economy. And only 2% of Indians pay tax. And therefore, the challenge was that how do you make the formal economy, the informal economy, into a formal economy using digital technology? And how do you make India grow into a $10 trillion economy by putting the black economy into the formal system? And that's why he pushed this process of demonetization of large currency notes. But one other thing as a consequence of this was that he pushed the process of digital payments using the mobile phone. Yeah. Yeah. And mobile phone, he's pushed very hard. So my belief is what he's pushed for are two, three different things. For 350 million people who have uh, smartphones, he's made a banking system which is interoperable. So you have a, a new app called the Beam app which enables you to transact. But for people with GSM phones, you have the star double nine hash which enables you to transact business for another plot. But for 300 million people who do not have mobiles at all, he's using what is known as the Aadhaar, use your thumb. And you, once you have your biometric, either your thumb or your iris, you are absolutely secure. There's absolute 100% security because you, you, you have a two-factor authentication of your Aadhaar number, your biometric number, but nobody can replicate your thumb impression or your iris. So it's the most safe, safe and secure method. And it makes it so easy for you to do your debit, credit card. It goes like a boom. And therefore, my view is that by 2020, India will replace all debit cards, all credit cards, all ATMs, all POS oh, machines. Possibly all cash. Uh, all cash. And all transactions will happen only through the biometric system of Aadhaar. So India is in the midst of one of the biggest technological revolutions that it will is. take place ever in history of mankind that is shifting away from debit. It will be a radical disruption in the payment mechanism using digital technology. It has never before happened in the world. At that by scale. 2020 of this scale, yeah. that a billion people transaction, transacting on the basis of their thumb or on the basis of their iris. That is the level of transaction. That is the level of huge digital trans transformation that is taking place. And you know, fortunately in India, we have created the back end of it. Because you've created the back end, you've created uh, a huge jam trinity, mobile, uh, biometrics. You've created a banking interoperable system. And therefore, he's pushed for it in a big way. Now, his belief is that digitization, the digital India movement, will push the process of digitization across manufacturing. 
It'll, in manufacturing will become more and more digital yeah. by nature in India. The consumer will decide the choice of his manufacturing. He will, he's pushed the process of, de of digitization uh, using the biometrics across every single yeah. government scheme. Nothing gets transferred without biometrics. But the important thing is that he's made it multi-stakeholder consultation process. What he believes in is that you need to discuss at the lowest level, that is at the level of the gram panchayat, at the level of the district, and at the level of, uh, you know, uh, state levels, the, because India is a very vast country. India is not like Switzerland. India is like 24 countries of Europe plus another 30,000 kilometers. And therefore, you need to make it multi-stakeholder consultations. And therefore, what we are finding today is that through this multi-stake uh, consultations, actually the tribal groups, the illiterate class, the people living below the poverty line, are actually the biggest agents of change in India. They are the ones who are using digital technology to leapfrog. They are far ahead in adopting digital technology than the, the, the urban elite, than the rich and famous. And therefore, my belief is that India will transform itself through this multi-state discussion holder. And therefore, whatever regime you have in the world, whatever regime you have for management of the digital system across the world, it has to be multi-sectoral. Yeah. You know, thank you, uh, Mr. Kant, and I think just one statistic before I see if there are any questions. Uh, this morning I heard that 10 years ago, 85% of the assets in the entire SMP were tangible. Today, 84% to be exact of all the assets in the SMP are intangible. So when a country like India says, we're going to become a digital country, data will become the new currency, I think you know that they have found out where the money really is now. The assets are no longer intangibles. They are in data and how data is being used and how data is being distributed and managed and frankly combined as AI will. Uh, I just came from a session where Mark Benioff, the CEO of, uh, uh, was sharing that very soon all the data from security systems will not be analyzed by humans. It will be analyzed by machines. So we're entering that stage where data and data currencies will be very critical. So uh, to close on what you said also, Mr. Kant, I think it's very important to appreciate that the policies India is doing at a national level are policies that do not separate India from the world. There are other major powers that are building national digital policies that separate their countries from the transnational community that is built by the digital space. India has shown tremendous commitment that while it is deploying national policies for the digital space, it is doing them in a congruence method with all the global policies on the internet. And that's really uh, a very important subject in the network that we've been discussing, how to make sure that major economies uh, do not uh, separate. So in conclusion, uh, for those of you who do not know about these new efforts at the forum, we thought this gave you hopefully some background. Is there any question that anyone wishes to ask of myself or of any members of the panel? Uh, this is a good time to raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we will uh, close the session, please. Very interesting to listen what Switzerland has been doing, and, and, and that was really impressing, uh, impressive to listen to you, Mr. Kant. My question goes to you, Fatih. How do you organize yourself? I mean, the challenges are immense out yes. there. So how do you organize to get your work done? So we have been designing first the elements. It's a system. So let me start by, I'm an engineer. To build a governance model for the 21st century, you cannot just approach it by having working groups. You need to create a system. And a system includes multiple components. We defined those components. And we worked with political science at Harvard and Oxford and different places to design that model of how each of these groups will work. How will it function? How will the outcome of what they do gets viewed to be legitimate and acceptable by the community? How do we ensure they're transparent? They're open, that the outcomes are then used. 
Then the second thing we did is we designed what happens to the outcomes from these networks uh, post-design. So all the networks do is design a new protocol. Then that protocol has to be implemented. And then it has to be adjudicated. So you have three phases. Designing the new protocol, implementing it, and then dealing with conflicts around the protocol. So we, we have designed that whole system. You're seeing kind of the tip of the iceberg now with the networks, but all of that is in motion and we're testing it right now because this is new. It has, this hasn't been done before. We solve governance problems in the 20th century through the national system and the international system. In the 21st century, this system is failing the digital space for a number of reasons that I don't need to get into. But the digital space is challenged today uh, to, be, to find a rule system that fits its speed and its transnational nature. So we're building a new system to address that. And that's the novelty of what the forum is doing. That is why this is very unique and different, frankly, from the other activities that happen at the forum. This is an activity to actually shape a new governance system uh, moving forward for the world. And we can, we can do this offline. I, can, uh, I will share and I will be with the forum writing some papers about that system because it's something quite revolutionary in the way we deal with 21st century issues. Any other questions from the floor? Okay, well, we thank you for braving the cold outside and the heat inside, but uh, uh, thank you for taking a little bit of time to hear about this, and we look forward to work with you on these networks and new ones we're going to launch next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.